was a dream, they say. A delirium, hallucination. As if we can say what dreams are. Right? As if it mattered at all what it was. I mean, you name it, it doesn't change. You think of language as the shaper of reality. But what if words fail us? For example, a dream that actually happened. What is the word for that? Dreams, as we all know, are very queer things. Some parts are presented with uh, appalling vividness, with details as bright and distinct as the finish on fine jewelry. Other parts are epic, blurry, as if one is racing through both space and time. Dreams are spurred on not by the head, but by the heart. Uh, somehow, logic imposes itself on us and has its way with us. My mind has shown incomprehensible cruelty to my heart, even as I slept. I am a ridiculous man. They call me mad now. That would be a promotion. <laughs> right, we're not still the same ridiculous man for them as before. But I don't resent them anymore. Now, I love them all, even when they laugh at me. I would laugh at them myself, not at myself, but for love of them, if it did not make me so sad to look at them. Sad because they do not know the truth, and I do. How hard it is for one man who knows the truth. But uh, they don't understand this understand it. It's perhaps from the time I was seven years old, I knew I was ridiculous. In school, it was plain to me. Later, in college, it seemed as if every subject was founded on the premise that I was somehow a fool, that my ideas were false. I was floating in a vacuum. And it was the same with living as it was in the classroom. Others laughed at me and called me a fool whenever I spoke. Not one of them knew that if there was any single person who understood his own ludicrous nature, it was myself. So, of course, I didn't resent their laughter. I knew we were all in agreement. And since I grew into manhood, I relaxed into this understanding. I began to accept how foolish and without purpose I truly was. In fact, it became clear to me more and more, that each thing on the earth is equal to another thing, and that each thing is tiny and insignificant, because each thing is made of the same cells and atoms in the same way, so nothing on the earth or under the stars, in the heavens, uh, under the ground, it makes the slightest difference to anything else. I even came to believe that, that most of the things that existed now could not have been proven to have existed before now and that after I was gone, I would have no evidence anything further would remain. Hence, no past, yet purposeless present, non-existent future. It was all the same to me. I was saved from this folly, from this, this ridiculousness on the 3rd of November. I remember every instant since. It was then, on the 3rd of November, that I dreamt. I saw the truth. I come here to tell you. It was also on that night that I decided to take my own life. It's a coincidence, <laughs> <laughs> to be sure. It was a gloomy evening. I was coming home at about 11 o'clock. Rain had been falling all day, and it was spitefully cold. When it stopped, it was followed by a horrible dampness. It's far worse than the rain, and a sort of steam was rising from everything, every stone in the street. The sky was dark, but one could distinctly make out tattered clouds, and between them, endless black patches. And I saw in one of these patches a star. I 
began watching it intently. It was because that star had given me the idea to end my life. Why that star did that to me, I don't know. And then my elbow felt a tug. And I turned to see a waif, a little girl, a little more than seven or eight. She had wet, broken shoes. They caught my eye particularly, and she's sputtering up some nonsense, shivering and barking like a dog. I understood that her mother was dying, that she'd gone out to find someone to get something to help, and I tried to shake her away from me and said, get away, go, go find a policeman. I shook her about as best I could, trying to lift my elbow away from her, but she would not leave me. Couldn't she see how I was exactly the wrong person, I thought, to help anyone? Didn't the star shine on her and tell her that I was about to do myself in? She begged, and it only made me louder, get off of me! She waved, she persisted, and it was revolting. Just in the moment when I felt I would do anything, anything to get her off of me, she ran away from me to a stranger across the street. So I was free to return home. I have a room in a flat where there are other lodgers. There's a retired old army captain, for example, who keeps odd hours and gets into fights over vodka with his many guests. There's a thin woman with three ill children who also stayed within arm's reach of me. I never paid them any mind. I did my best to avoid them on that night and on many, many other nights. My room is small and poor with a garret window in the shape of a semicircle, and I went there at once, trying to maintain the purity of my purpose. I sat. My ideas wander through my mind. I let them come and go as they will. A whole candle is burnt. I sat down quietly at my table. the revolver and put it down before me, and I asked myself, shall I shoot myself in the head? And answered too quickly, I shall shoot myself in the head. I knew that I should kill myself that night, for certain. It's the little girl, you see? kept me from ending my life. The question was simple, but impossible to reason. If I'm going to kill myself in two hours, say, what, what is the little girl to me? I shall turn into nothing, absolutely nothing. I shall completely cease to exist immediately. And so everything shall completely cease to exist. Stamped and shouted at the unhappy child, as though to say not only, I feel no pity, but moreover, I have no use for you, or for pity, for in two hours everything under the heavens shall be extinguished. Do you think that that was why I shouted that? <laughs> I'm almost convinced of it now. It seemed clear to me that life and the world somehow depended on me being present. I may almost say that the world now seemed created for me alone. If I shot myself, the world would cease to exist. And one might say a complete reversal, but this is not truly so. I still felt very much at the center of things. I could not die now without having first settled something. The child had saved me. For I put off my pistol shot for the sake of these questions. After all that, after coming so close to making myself extinct, and yet, and yet, feeling such compassion against my will for the despair of a child, I fell asleep <laughs> with my chair at the table. A thing which had never happened to me before. I dropped asleep quite unawares. It was then that I dreamed my dream of 
the 3rd of November. Now, whenever I relay this to an audience, to friends, or what I call friends, I met the same response. They say, as you may say, it was only a dream. But does it matter if it was a dream, a reality? Let it be a dream, so be it. This real life you seem to find so preferable. I had meant to extinguish that life through suicide. Listen. I suddenly dreamt that I picked up the revolver and aimed it straight at my heart. My heart, not my head. I had determined beforehand to fire at my head, my right temple. It did not feel any pain. But it seemed as though with my shot, everything within me was shaken and everything suddenly dimmed. I seemed to be blinded. And I was lying on something hard and stretched on my back. I could see nothing and could not make the slightest movement. People were walking and shouting all around me, the retired captain, the thin woman and her pale children bawling and shrieking. And then I was being carried in a closed coffin, and not long after, without the slightest struggle, I was buried in the earth. I did not move. I expected nothing, excepting without dispute that a dead man had nothing to expect. It was spitefully damp, <laughs> just after the rainfall. I don't know how long I was lying there prone. It could have been years, but all at once, a drop of water landed on my closed left eye, making its way through the coffin lid. It was followed a minute later by a second, and a minute later by a third, and so on regularly every minute. <laughs> There was a sudden glow of profound indignation in my heart, <laughs> and it manifested itself in almost physical pain. The water felt like a bullet into my head, and it was intolerable. It's difficult to describe the sensation of going from complete acceptance of infinite darkness to being annoyed <laughs> by the dripping of water. <clears throat> Something in me started. My engine began to run. And after all that time immobile, I called upon the power that was responsible for all that was happening to me. I opened my empty, cracked throat and said, Whoever you may be, if you are revenging yourself on me for my ridiculous suicide by the ridiculousness of this subsequent existence, then let me tell you that no torture could ever equal the contempt that I shall go on feeling, though my martyrdom may last a million years. <laughs> There's nothing. Silence. The silence was unbroken. Until, after another minute, another drop fell. Still, I knew, with infinite, unshakable certainty, that everything would change at once. And I knew this, without any doubt, I was no longer in the grave. I couldn't tell you if it was opened, or upturned, or simply dissolved with the passage of centuries. Who could say that it was not there, and let's agree, no one was. All I know is that I was suddenly picked up by a person, or rather a being, being. <laughs> and we found ourselves, this being and I, rushing between clusters of stars in freezing space. As I told you, the dream was remarkable. <laughs> I will tell you that the idea of a finite cosmos was disproved in that instance, and the idea that man is alone became impossible to me. In a universe, in an emptiness so complete, there could be nothing but countless derivations of the possible extended for the infinite reaches. What else could there be but everything inside this nothingness? What else, I say, could there be but all imaginable and more? I do not know how long we were flying. I cannot imagine it. It happened. A 
as it always does in dreams, where you skip past space and time and the laws of thought and existence and only pause upon the points for which the heart yearns. I remember, I suddenly saw in the distance a star. Is that serious, I asked, but I thought meant to ask questions. No, that is the star you saw between the clouds when you were coming home, the being who is carrying me replied. I knew it had something like a human face. But strange to say, I did not like that being. In fact, I felt an intense aversion to it. Here I was being carried by some creature that was not human, but outside the range of my knowledge, yet living, existing. I resented the idea of being in the thrall of the unknowable again, <coughs> that my belief that all things centered around my observance was challenged so completely. But I asked him, do you despise me? He did not answer my question. Fear was growing in my heart. Something had been mutely communicated to me by my silent companion, and it permeated my whole being. He felt, and I knew this, that I was foolish for even bothering to think he should bother to despise me. And again, I felt ridiculous. So I had come home to an empty house. We're flying through dark, unknown space. I expected something. I was not sure what I expected, but the anticipation of it filled me with a terrible anguish. And then, I suddenly caught sight of our sun. Now, I knew it could not be our sun that gave life to our Earth, but for some reason, I knew in my whole being that it was a sun exactly like ours, a duplicate of it. And I asked, almost to myself, that if this is the sun, and it is exactly the same as the one that nourished me and my kind, then where is the Earth? My companion pointed to a star twinkling in the distance with an emerald light. We were flying straight towards it. I knew, of course, it was the Earth, or its double. And in that instant, the image of the child who had begged for my help flashed through my mind. I must have been smiling like a lunatic because the being turned to me and looked as though I just swallowed a nail. He said, you will see one world inside another. And then that feeling of familiarity and happiness I felt was replaced quite suddenly with a sort of revulsion. I thought that if this is a new earth. It was made of the same forces and principles and pieces of old wood. I knew I could not love this earth like the one that I had been born on and bled on and pissed in. I could not love this earth because I had not suffered on it. Was I expected to shift my loyalty so quickly? I turned to this being to demand answers and he was gone. So I found myself standing on this other earth standing still as the stalks in the bright light of a sunny day, fair as paradise. Everything was exactly as it is with us, only everything seemed to glow with a sort of festive radiance. The splendor of some great holy triumph attained at last. The caressing sea green as emerald, splashed softly against the shore and kissed it with a manifest, almost conscious love. The tall, lovely trees stood in all the glory of their blossom, and their innumerable leaves greeted me, I am certain, with a soft, caressing rustle, and they seemed to articulate words of love. The grass glowed with bright and fragrant flowers that Birds were flying in flocks in the air. They perched fearlessly on my arms and my shoulders and joyfully struck me with their darling, fluttering wings. And at last, I saw and knew the people of this happy land. They surrounded me, kissed me. 
how beautiful they were. Never on our own earth had I seen such beauty in mankind. Was the earth untarnished by the fall? On it lived people who had not sinned. They lived in just such a paradise as that in which, according to all the legends of mankind, our first parents lived before they sinned. The only difference was that all this earth was the same paradise. They desired nothing. They were at peace. They did not aspire to knowledge of life as we do, because their lives were full. And that I understood. Their knowledge was higher and deeper than ours, because our science seeks to explain what life is, while they, without science, simply knew how to live. I could not understand their knowledge. They walked about their lovely woods. They sang their lovely songs. The work they did for food and raiment was brief and easy. They loved and begot children, while they rejoiced at the coming of children. There's no quarreling, no jealousy among them. Each child was the child of all. There was scarcely any illness, so there was death. If the old died peacefully, instead of falling into a gentle sleep. I never saw grief or tears on these occasions, only a perfect and contemplative love. In the night, before going to sleep, they liked singing to each other in a musical and harmonious chorus. They, they liked making songs about each other. They're the simplest songs, but they sprang from their hearts. It was like being in love with each other. But, but a universal, all-embracing feeling. And when they looked at me, sweet eyes, full of love, and I felt that in their presence. My heart became as just and innocent as theirs. The feeling of the fullness of life it took my breath away, and I worshipped them in silence. My heart may have originated the dream, but could my heart alone have been capable of originating the awful series of events which occurred thereafter? Could my heavy heart and fickle, trivial mind have risen to such apocalypse? Perhaps. Perhaps not. But. There is one thing I know in my heart beyond all doubt. The fact is that I corrupted them all. It was not a moment I could pinpoint on a road map. I only know that I was the source of their increasing questioning and wickedness. Like a germ that is passed by breath, so I contaminated all this earth. First, it was simply lying. They learned to toy with meanings, to be coy with the honest answer. They felt the fun in falsehood. They began innocently with a jest. They felt the joy of lying, and next they felt distrust. Easily that became jealousy of their lovers and a sense of ownership. It was not long before the first blood was shed. When it happened, between a man called Yuri and his brother, Emil, over a wife that each viewed as his own, some took the side of Yuri, and others took the side of Emil. Unions were forged from then on. 
as blood has the mesmerizing effect of throwing us both away from and towards one another. Through all this adultery and criminality, they came to know shame. And shame gave difficult birth to virtue. Virtue grew to be honor. And from honor sprang the flags of the Urians and the Emilites. Their separation for each other grew to further separations. For food and fun, they began torturing animals, and they withdrew from them into the forest and became hostile to them. They began to speak in different languages. First, the Urians broke into two violently opposed factions, the Urians and the Yomanites. Then the Emilites grew apart through geography. And from them, three distinct peoples grew, the Etigans, the Eomese, and the Emesians. Whatever culture that once joined them was forgotten, as their languages grew further and further apart. The Amesians, the Etigans, the Eomes, the Urians, the Yomanites. Five groups sprung from two brothers in the space of two weeks. It must have been. <laughs> I can't remember. I can't. It was a dream. They became acquainted with sorrow and basked in it. It was the Amesians. They claimed that true knowledge could not come without sorrow. So sorrow quickly and easily ate up their joy, as if sorrow's jaws were simpler, bigger, hind legs quicker to jump. They were a culture of depth and despair. Then that workhorse science galloped in and trod upon everything they once were. The Urians were progressives, and they began to dismantle the world around them, like surgeons learning from dead bodies. There was nothing too beautiful that they would not slice it apart to see how it worked. Trees, flowers, other Urians, children, wolves, fishes, Stones, it was all there for the embalming. All of it. As they became wicked, their response was to talk of brotherhood and humanitarianism as cures of what ailed them. And as they became criminal, they invented justice and drew up whole legal codes. The Yomanites were fond of jurisprudence. In order to ensure that these legal codes were honored, they installed a guillotine. They hardly remembered what they once were, and refused to believe that they had ever been happy and innocent. But even as they laughed at the idea of some long-forgotten perfection, they set up grand cathedrals in honor of the very idea, preaching about the legendary songs they used to sing in the woods. And the more they worshipped their own past, the more unattainable it seemed to them. Nevertheless, it was clear that each of them relished their own knowledge more than the harmonious life I dropped of them. If I could find a way to give them their old selves back, they surely would have refused it. I came to an Urian man and I asked him how he felt that in so few generations, so few weeks, their world could have fallen apart so quickly. He said, would you rather we acted like Edigans? Fish? Preserved meat with salt? And wore sheepskins? He smiled and laughed. And he said that whatever knowledge we had can be relearned. It will be deepened by our distance from it. We are as we are meant to be. No longer children, but adults. The problems of adults. The consciousness of life is higher than life. Knowledge of the laws of happiness is higher than happiness. It's a clever answer. His smile, the smile of a clever man. Cleverness became pride. They began to compare themselves to one another. And of course, each grew to feel his own intrinsic superiority in some way. The Urians looked down on the Edigans as barbarians. The Edigans hated the Yomanites for their Yomanish justice. The Yomanites wondered at the Eomese and their secret lives and sent parties to study them, only to write books of terrible judgment <coughs> upon them. 
Slavery followed, even voluntary slavery. The weak eagerly submitted to the strong on condition that the latter aided them to subdue the still weaker. The system was so corrupted it begot saints to preach against it. Of course, saints' blood was shed. Sacred blood flowed in the threshold of the temples. Then there arose the idea that there might still be harmony, but only if each man, loving himself best of all, would simply avoid interfering with other onanists. Wars sprang up over this idea. <laughs> Each man with a gun believed amazingly in progress and would snuff out as much life as possible to see that progress made. They believed that the instinct for self-preservation would eventually cause their foes to stop before too many wars coughed up too many bodies. During this time, all religions became focused entirely on the afterlife and the Amesians became the dominant culture. Their books of glorious death, the promises of the afterlife. It was the beginning of suicide. Each life seemed to have less meaning than the one before it. It was strange. For a while, I was entranced and moved by these people when the world was unpolluted. But now, now that it was filled with sorrow, my love for them was overwhelming. At last, this is the earth I can recognize. It's imperfect, broken, bleeding all over itself. My voice began to rise above the whisper that had contained it. I took to the streets and threw myself on the doors of the philosophers and the politicians. I blamed myself for infecting them with the disease that you and I carry. I begged the arts to write new songs. I got down on my knees and in the tongues of the ancient Urians and Emilites, I begged. I even tried to imitate their first language, the one before the wife had died, but not a single person remembered it. To try to think of some way, anything, to let them know how much I loved them, how much they needed to punish me for what I had done. My mind pulled images from my own life. I asked the priest to nail two boards together and crucify me. I could not kill myself. I had not the strength. But I wanted to suffer at their hands. I yearned for suffering. I longed that my blood should be drained to the last drop in these agonies. And they only laughed at me. They at last saw that I was ridiculous. They said that there was no time before the brothers and their wife. Even if there was, they would not want it back. They at last came to see me, not so much as an outsider, but as one of them. Some even thought that I had always been there and was only pretending to observe them like an alien. <coughs> they said I was dangerous. They said I was insane. I cried and begged for them to spill my blood and <coughs> they only shunned me. <coughs> I felt as though I were dying dying without a drop of blood. And then I awoke, alone. I thought of the waif, of the innocence of those people, of the retired captain next door kicking against the wall with a foot full of vodka. How they had refused to crucify me. I stared at the revolver. I thought of what had been revealed to me. And I was overjoyed. I had seen something beautiful, there was no doubt. Perhaps in the end it was my desire to die that did in fact give birth to me. Since then, I have been speaking, much as I am now, 
to anyone who will listen to me, in this case, the 20 of you. <laughs> I have seen the truth. I will not and cannot believe that evil is the normal condition of mankind. Nothing is inevitable. Each part of us wants to be beautiful and in love and unprejudiced. If it were so that human life is nothing but a speck of grit, uh, a little piece of carbon settling around a little piece of hydrogen in a universe of dark matter, then why should some part of me think only of a child before blowing my own brains onto my favorite chair? Why should that matter against all reason? Because compassion is the basic component of the human race. So do you know, when I first started telling the story of my dream, I would conceal the fact that I had been the purpose of their corruption. I thought it would damage my credibility, for one. <laughs> and for another, I was ashamed. I'm not ashamed anymore. But I do make my penance by telling the truth now. So, how to establish paradise? I do not know. I lost control of words ever since my dream. All the necessary ones, anyway, the, the key ones. Words are not limited. Words are limits. Nevertheless, I shall go on with words insufficiently, if only to show how insufficient a mind can be. Though suppose this paradise never comes to pass, that I understand. Yet, I shall go on preaching it. And yet, how simple it is, in one day, in one hour, Everything could be arranged at once. The chief thing is to love others like yourself. That is the chief thing. To, to look at somebody who you think is worth nothing, uh, worth no more or less than anyone else, and, and to give them the same benefits of um, kindness and respect that you would expect of them. To treat them as if they are good because you are good. Together, that is how we all are. That, that is the chief thing. That is the truth. Consciousness of life is higher than life. The knowledge of the laws of happiness is higher. That is what one must contend against. And I shall. Because if only everyone wants it, it can be arranged at once. So I want it. Hmm. And I hope that you want it too. <laughs> For my part, I want to begin the arrangements. That's why I tracked down that little girl. <laughs>